case is uh, David Buckley. David graduated from this university a year ago, computer science degree, and is now on the first, sorry, second, second. year of the CBT program. Uh, he's been working in the machine learning and optimization group for the last six months under the supervision of Kay Chen. Uh, and this is his interest in gaming. So he's going to uh, tell us about how he's applying these principles uh, of machine learning to uh, games. Thank you. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about adaptivity, specifically in video games. Uh, just so I get an idea, how many people here have played a video game before? <laughs> Fantastic, good, we're on the same wavelength. Okay, so one of the first like, responses I get from people when I tell them I'm doing a PhD in video games is, uh, well, half of the people say, oh, that's cool, that's cool. The other half of the people say, Research. So uh, I'm just going to uh, outline where exactly sort of in computer science it stands. So it's mostly machine learning adaptivity. Uh, it's a little bit of HCI, human computer interaction, and, uh, and how a player interacts with the computer. And it's a little bit of psychology. And that sort of makes up adaptivity as a whole. So games. This is Crisis. It's well known for being beautiful, basically, uh, pushing the, the uh, boundaries of the state of the art. And uh, this isn't what I'm doing. Uh, I'm not doing a PhD in graphics. This is sort of uh, advanced interfaces group realm more. So that, that would be research in uh, rendering and, and shaders and stuff like that. And this is Unreal Tournament. There's research uh, going into uh, bots uh, and artificial intelligence in the world. And um, I'm not doing that either. Uh, that's artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm doing machine learning, which is very similar, but it's slightly different. And this is Portal. It's one game of the year. This is a fantastic game, innovative, loads of great game mechanics, and it's also not what I'm doing. This is for game designers. This is uh, more commercial stuff than, uh, than what I'm doing. And this is Left 4 Dead. This is a, a zombie survival game where the, the players have to get to an end goal. And I actually am doing a little bit of this. So in Left 4 Dead, there's an AI director which controls some of the game content. It monitors the players, it monitors the intensity of the game, and adjusts it accordingly. And this is what I'm doing. So why should we be adapting games? Well, everyone has different preferences. People have different tastes in music, in the same way they have different tastes in games. Some players like racing games, and some players like first-person shooters. In fact, players can have different preferences in the same genre. So players of World of Warcraft can like hitting things, or they might like go collecting things or selling things. So by adapting the game, we can increase the, the audience. People also have different skill levels. So some people are better than others, some people are terrible. So it would be great if we can adapt the game to, uh, to account for that as well. So if a game is too hard, we need to decrease frustration. And that's just one example of how we can adapt the game. And at the end of the day, why shouldn't we adapt the game? We have machine learning techniques which can learn players' opinions, play, how players like things. And the games are run on computers. So why not? The next question is what can we adapt? So here's a big list, or a short list actually, of things that you can adapt. And I'm going to be looking at four of these just for now to give you an idea of what you can adapt. So enemies is the first one. Here's a screenshot of a game, Black Mesa, in which you have uh, a few enemies in the distance. Nice and easy, straightforward. What happens if you've got a tank and three turrets? What are you going to do? And this is an example of how changing the, the enemies can change the game, how changing the frequency of your opponents um, and uh, the, the types of enemies that you see. We can also adapt the weapons, the weapon types, uh, when they appear, where they appear. So here we go. This is uh, another screenshot of Black Mesa. You have a giant fish, and you've got to shoot it with a crossbow. Not too difficult. What if you have a crowbar? So that's how changing where the weapons appear can change the game. You can also change the levels. So people have different, different uh, preferences in games. So this is an example of where you have to navigate a lot of trip mines in case the whole world explodes, basically. And uh, so you can either do that, or you actually might just enjoy jumping over platforms. And that's a different type of level. So we could adapt the frequency in which these types of levels appear in the game. 
And finally, difficulty. This is a bit more, a bit harder to show with screenshots, but uh, this has been present for a while in games. So it's been known as dynamic difficulty adjustment, trying to change how the game is played by people to, to make it harder or, or easier for players, depending on how good they are. So you could change uh, how, how the damage is inflicted or received, or you could change other components that I've just talked about to change the difficulty. So more enemies obviously means a harder game, for instance. So some examples of adaptivity include Adaptive Doom, which some, some of you might have heard of. Uh, Jonathan Roberts is working here in the department, and he's been working on creating random Doom levels to try and figure out what combination of these uh, enemies, le uh, weapons, levels, players like. So might alter the, the number of enemies that you might have, um, all the, the different types, the combinations, and then try and figure out, using machine learning, what you actually like. Next, here's an example of the Galactic Arms Race game, which is uh, part of a research project in evolutionary algorithms. So evolutionary algorithms in machine learning are similar to the biological idea in which that uh, small mutations happen. Uh, so in this case, the weapons are changed slightly to produce different concepts. So a player can select over a long period of time what sort of weapons they like by trying out different things, and the computer can infer what they actually like. Max Payne is an early example of dynamic difficulty adjustment. Aim assist could be enabled automatically, as well as changing how much damage uh, the player was doing, depending on how well you were doing in the game. And I've already mentioned Left 4 Dead, but here is a, a, a graph that uh, Valve produced in their presentation about how the AI director works. So in the top row, we have a population that uh, the, the game would like to put out, how many monsters it had, like over a period of time. So on the left, we have a close cluster of monsters, and then a few minutes later, you might have another cluster. The second row is what the AI director thinks that the intensity should be like. So the relaxed areas are where it would like to relax the game, make it easy, and then it spikes it again, lots of monsters. So the, the final row is the combination of the two, trying to adjust the, the number of monsters, essentially. And that's a simple example of adaptivity. There are two parts to adaptivity in games. The first one is player modeling. The second is optimization. So this first part is trying to figure out what the player is feeling. If we don't know what the player is feeling, how can we adapt the game? So we have to create some kind of model based on what the player is feeling. So we do this via data collection. There are different ways of doing this, first of which might be physiological data. We could uh, plug someone up to a machine, measure their heart rate, respiration, sweat, stuff like that. Except it's very intrusive and it's quite noisy as well at times. So another way might be observation, observing people. We can watch players as they're playing a game. That's a bit more difficult with video game players because they all sit like this. <laughs> so. Uh, an alternative is asking them directly, but then we have the problem of people might lie, people might not know how they feel. And this is all falls under the category of human computer interaction and trying to figure out how players, what, whether players are enjoying themselves or not. Log files are a key to this. If we can record what the players are doing and somehow attribute that to how players are feeling, so watching what they're doing, we can then perhaps automatically determine whether they're enjoying themselves or not. Examples of the data you might record are low-level data might be a mouse movement or key presses. A high-level data might be the number of kills you get or the number of interactions you have with another player. The second step, optimization, is using the player model that we've got and trying to adjust the emotions that they're feeling. So here's a small algorithm example of an algorithm you might use to optimize the game. You get someone to play a level, you work out what they're feeling, using one of the previous techniques we discussed. You then change the level slightly, use our model to determine whether the player will now enjoy this more or less. And then if it is, we, we've done it right. If not, we have to adjust the level again. And you could just keep repeating this to try and make the level better and better. So some examples of uh, the application of this in research today include uh, Mario. So uh, a, an open source version of Mario has been used to try and do some player modeling, trying to figure out 
six different emotions of players. So they've tried to model um, frustration, predictability, anxiety, uh, difficulty, for instance, um, and then using that to then optimize the game. So on the right, we have a game with lots of gaps and a game with lots of enemies. So by using those emotions, we can adjust from, flip from one to the other depending on what the response might be. They also do some feature selection to determine which of these features are most important. So it might be the case that the direction the player is going is a very important feature. On the other hand, it might be the case that lots of shells might be very important to note. And they do some analysis of this. So they, they try and figure out the behavior and the, the correlation between how a player is feeling and what it's recording, essentially, which is very interesting to uh, my research particularly. And then secondly, I'd like to discuss uh, the Playware platform. It's not a video game, but the principles apply. So in this uh, testbed, there are several tiles which a ch child, for instance, might interact with. So you press a tile, and then you've interacted with the game. So an example game might be uh, something equivalent to whack-a-mole, where you uh, hit a mole with a hammer. Um, so you can measure the interactions between the player and the game. So measuring how hard they're pressing the tile, for instance, might indicate they're having lots of fun, or they're very frustrated, maybe. So they do a little bit of uh, optimization with this platform, trying to optimize the, the emotions which have, we've already modeled using the game. So there is, this is essentially applied computer science. One example of the modules that is very applicable to this is uh, Comp 24111, which some of you might be doing or have done, and the machine learning module. Uh, so you learn some feature selection in that with the uh, digit data. Uh, you also do some uh, SVMs as well, and that's very important, very integral to the research I'm doing. Um, you also mention neural networks as well, and all of this correlates very strongly with this sort of research. But also it goes into further depth, having a look at different learning algorithms, such as uh, active learning, which John, Jonathan Roberts is using in his project. Another example of a mod another, uh, module which is very important is the uh, image processing module, in which we have here uh, representations of levels in 2D. So we've got a very open level on the right and a level with more corridors on the left. And so you could represent these in any number of ways, but here's just two examples. If you've got image processing techniques, you can work out, for instance, how wide the corridors are using granularity um, techniques, or try eroding or diffusing to try and figure out features that might be important. So my research in particular is focusing on uh, first-person shooters, multiplayer first-person shooters. So an example of that is Team Fortress 2 here on the right, which uh, is quite popular these days. In particular, I'm focusing on the levels in a multiplayer first-person shooter, which is known as a map in this area. Uh, this is the architecture, or the area that you play in. Uh, so it includes things like walls, uh, ceilings, mountains that might be in the way. Uh, if we can explore that, we can find out what sort of features might be interesting. Uh, so here's an example of a map. There's a, a room, a small room with a control point. Um, these are all features of the map that might be very interesting to measure. One key aspect that I'll be exploring in my PhD is log files. We have to figure out what sort of features, what things are interesting in this log file. So that's where feature selection and feature extraction are important. Because mouse movement might be really integral to uh, how, what a player is feeling. So if a player is moving a mouse wildly, they might be really excited. But we don't know that. And no one's had a look at it yet. So that's why we have to do research into that. And we also have to do feature extraction to try and find more high-level examples that we can record. So this is uh, the architecture of my research. Uh, on the left, we can see the satisfaction model, and this is the player modeling part of the research. And on the right, we have the optimization stage, where the feedback happens, where the, the map model, or the model of the player's preference for a particular level, is fed back into the generator, which could produce a more optimal map. So as you can see, the player plays the game, which produces a log file. On the very left, you might just make out a, uh, a little file with a queue in, and that's the questionnaire. So we need to figure out what features of the log file are important, and by doing that, we'd ask a player initially. 
but hopefully over time we'll be able to remove the, the need for that questionnaire so that further research can go on without having to ask anything of the, the player and just read it all from a log file somewhere. And finally, these are the challenges that my research and research in this field face. So, as I've already mentioned, we need to find the features in a log file. And that's quite a difficult task, particularly if actually nothing is correlated. And that's quite hard to work out. Um, if we've got a multiplayer game, we have to be able to model multiple players at the same time. Because everyone might be feeling something different, and we might be playing the same map, but not everyone might like that map. So we have to work that out. In addition, we have to be able to distinguish between the feeling you might have for an opponent and the feeling you have for a level. If you're playing on a map you really like, but you hate all the players who are, who are playing it, you're not going to enjoy the game. If you're playing on a map you hate, but you like the people, maybe you'll enjoy it. So you have to be able to determine the difference between those. And that's a uh, challenge we face. The representation of levels is important. Um, as, as people who have studied machine learning might know, the more features you have, the more complicated the machine learning side is. It's, uh, it becomes slower, it becomes harder, it becomes more, more fuzzy. So we have to be able to represent the levels compactly while describing them thoroughly. And finally, your, changes, your preference changes over time. So like in music, you might like emo music when you're 15, and you might like rap when you're 20, but by the time you're 40, you might be listening to classical music. So we have to be able to determine which levels you like at a particular moment in time. Because you might like going, going from first-person shooters to role-playing games, and we have to be able to account for that. And, uh, and that's it. Are there any questions? Well, yes? I personally love the frustration of the games. So, because it like, um, sort of what appeals me to sort of challenge myself. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I don't know, like, Super Meat Boy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but, when I start with So, how would you sort of account for that? Like, people sort of make preferences for the difficulty that they like. Um, there are player types, yeah. so some players uh, might have different preferences. So you might like frustration. So when we were doing our data collection, uh, when we're asking questions, we can ask whether they enjoyed the game and ask them whether they were frustrated. Um, and they might fall under a particular type of player. Uh, there's also possibly, I was talking about this re uh, recently with someone, there might be two different types of frustration. A frustration with yourself, because you can't complete something, and a frustration with the game, which is not usually very enjoyable. Like if you're playing something and it's a terrible game, it's not fun. Exactly, exactly. Yes? Um, how generic are the models that you can create for the first production shooters? Are they, does it only work with one specific game or can it work with, is it reasonably adaptable that you can use it with other first production shooters? Um, it depends on the data we use. Um, so, if we manage to get the low-level data to work, uh, things that are common among lots of first person shooters, then it would be very generic. So, mouse movement, um, key presses. It would have, we'd have to do research to, uh, to make sure that it, would, it does actually apply to different games, because even first person shooters have very different mechanics. Um, so, Counter-Strike Source uh, has, it's very uh, mechanic base, so, so if you make one small mistake, that could be it for you. Whereas uh, something like Team Fortress 2 I posted an example of before, it's much more forgiving. Um, so there might be differences that we'd have to account for. There you go. Uh, these profiles you create, are mm -hmm. these transferable between different genres of computer games? Like if there's a sports simulation, is somebody who plays a sports simulation likely to have the same behavior on a first person shooter? Um, so it's a similar, similar response. Um, yes and no. Um, there are there are player types, as I mentioned. So there are there are four player types apparently in the gaming world, like all together. Um, so and you will generally fall under one or maybe two of these um, at one time. Uh, but so you will behave similarly with respect to other players, but you you might do different things, if that makes sense. So there, you'd have to adapt the model, essentially, uh, the player model, to the game as well, particularly if you're going between genres. Yep? Uh, 
in terms of feelings about the levels and the players, could you just discuss some of the ideas that you've been, you know, considering for that? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? In terms of the feelings for the players and the levels, right, the difference in them, mm -hmm. could you just consider, um, could you just discuss some of the ideas that you've been considering for that, as in how to differentiate between the two? Between the two... Feelings for the... Oh, I see, right, okay, yeah. Um, Range quits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, at the moment, I've been considering... Um, well, one of, one of the ways to get around this is to uh, increase the number of games you play, particularly against other players, so, so changing the, the uh, diversity between players. And if you find correlations between particular players, so if you play um, a player over different maps and you always feel the same, then it's likely that, uh, that you, it's the player you don't like rather than the map. Um, that's, that's one of the, the risks I have with my research. It might be the case that it's too hard to actually do that. Um, so, in which case, um, we'd have to take a step back again and, uh, and have a look at it again. But shall I look at that feature and say, uh, number of offensive words in the player? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, it might be the case that you just were straight to the game and you're swearing at everyone anyway. <laughs> yep. So, you did this with your PhD? Yes. And you get to write a thesis. <coughs> About video games, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at, at the end of your thesis, you're going to want to have some conclusions, which yes. are based on some evidence, mm -hmm. which is scientifically provable. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's sort of interesting that a lot of the motivation here is about how people feel. Mm -hmm. So what, what kind of population of players are you going to need to do this research on to, find, to really substantiate some concrete conclusions in your thesis? Um, a couple of hundred, probably. Um, hopefully less. Um, so Jonathan Roberts got uh, at least 100 players um, playing his, his game online. Um, so one of the stages of this research is to uh, release it online so people can play from wherever and whenever, um, which will certainly increase the number of players and uh, hopefully validate the claims. Uh, but then, then we obviously get into the issue of people lying and having to do uh, crowd sourcing essentially of the data. Um, Yes. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Any more questions? No? Okay. Uh, thank you, David. Um, it's your if you're interested, the, all of these research talks are going online, so if you just Google Manchester Research Showcase, all this talk and subsequent ones are online. Um, next week's talk is going to be from Alan Stokes, who's going to be talking about sensor networks. It should be interesting. So come on if you're interested. And thank, join, me, join me in thanking David.